good day. This is our first online lecture for preventive medicine and community health too. This afternoon, we'll be tackling sampling techniques and sample size. Our objectives for this lecture are the following. Let us review what is research. It's a systematic, controlled, empirical, and critical investigation of phenomena guided by theory and hypothesis about relations among phenomena. It's organized in systematic ways of finding answers to questions. And for the past semester, we've been studying problem statements, theories, variables, and hypotheses, definitions, research designs, and subsequent lectures will tackle on sampling and instrumentation, data analysis, conclusions, and recommendations. Important statistical terms to remember would be the population, which is a set which includes all measurements of interest to the researcher, and a sample, which is just about a subset of the population. Why sampling? It's impossible to get information about large populations. Therefore, sampling would help in decreasing cost, decreasing time to accumulate data, increase accuracy, and when it's possible to study the whole we have terms that we have to know. The target population is the population to be studied to which the investigator wants to generate his results. Sampling unit is the smallest unit from which sample can be selected. The sampling frame lists all the sampling units from which samples are drawn. And the sampling scheme is the method of selecting sampling units from the sampling frame. So when we do sample a population, we ask ourselves questions. So what's our population of interest? To whom do you want to generalize results? It could either be, for example, for the recent outbreak. Are doctors more susceptible? Is there a certain population that is more at increased risk? Why are children spared? So these are the questions questions that you could ask regarding the recent coronavirus. Can you sample the entire population? For now, since current cases in the Philippines would just be 400, it's still possible. But when it does increase, like what happened in China, sampling a thousand patients would not be eventually feasible. And three factors that influence sample representativeness would be how we collect samples with the procedure, sample size, and sample participation. What are the instances that you might be able to sample the entire population? When your population is very small, when you have extensive resources, and when you don't expect a very high resource. So we get a population and we narrow it down to a certain sub subset that would be a representative sample so that we could generalize conclusions to represent the whole population. So there are two types of sampling. One is non-probability sampling. One is probability. The process in getting samples would be first defining a population, then we specify a sample frame, we specify a sampling method so that we could determine sample size, so that we could implement the sampling plan, and eventually com com collect the data and review the sample process. So for non-probability sampling, some elements have no chance of selection or where the probability of selection cannot be accurately determined. What are the examples of this? 
these would be convenient samples wherein sampling would be dependent on ease of access. Snowball sampling, it's a referral system. You get a sample by asking a friend of a friend, a referral of a referral, etc. Purposive sampling, judgmental, this is usually used when we are looking for expert opinions on a certain subject matter. Quota sample, we get um, information from a certain number of people. Non-probability sampling, probability of being chosen is unknown. It's cheaper but harder to generalize. There's a large potential for bias. As to probability sampling, every unit in the population has a chance of being selected in the sample and this can be accurately determined. So when every element in the population has the same chance of selection, this is called equal probability of selection. Samples of probability sampling would be random sampling. So each subject has a known probability of being selected. This would allow application of statistical sampling that would result to generalization and test hypothesis. Conclusions would be that probability sampling would be superior to non-probability sampling because it ensures representativeness and precision. Methods that we could use in probability sampling would be simple random sampling, systematic sampling, stratified sampling, multi-stage sampling, cluster sampling. Simple random sampling is applicable when population is small, homogeneous, and readily available. All would have equal probability of selection and it would provide the greatest number of possible samples. For example, a table of random numbers or lottery system is used to determine which units are to be selected. Estimates are easy to calculate, so it's always an equal probability sampling design, but not all EPS designs are simple random sampling. Disadvantages would be if sampling frame is too large, method is impractical, and minority subgroups of interest may not be present in the sample. Replacement of selected units. So it may be without replacement. No element can be selected more than once or with replacement. An element may appear multiple times in the sample. So, for example, for simple random sampling in this given population, number 20 is chosen, and then number 40, and then number 29. There is no certain order in which the samples are taken from. So this is an example of a table of random numbers, something wherein we could take a certain sample. Systematic sampling. So there's a sampling fraction. It's the ratio between sample size and population size. It relies on arranging the target population according to some ordering scheme and then selecting elements at regular intervals through that ordered view. Systematic sampling, it involves a random start and then proceeds with the selection of every k element from then onwards. In this case, k is equal to population size over sample size. It is most important that the starting point is not always the first one on the list. It is an EPS selection. Advantages of systematic sampling would be the samples are easy to select. There's a suitable sampling frame which can be identified easily. Sample is evenly spread over the entire reference population. Disadvantages of which it may be biased if there is a hidden periodicity 
and it may be difficult to assess precision of estimate from one survey. So for example, we start with number 8. Next sample would be number 28. And then the next sample would be 48. So we get by 20s. Stratified sampling is wherein a population embraces a number of distinct categories. Then each stratification is then sampled as an independent subpopulation. Every unit in a stratum has some chance of being selected. For example, male, female, doctor, non-doctor, etc. Cluster sampling is a group of sampling units close to each other crowding together in the same area or neighborhood. It could be one stage or two stage. The difference with, wherein all of the elements with the selected clusters are included in the sample. Two stage, a subset of elements within selected clusters are randomly selected for inclusion in the sample. Advantages of cluster sampling it cuts down the cost of preparing a sample frame, reduced travel time, and other administrative costs. Disadvantage would be sampling error is higher for a simple random sample of the same size. So for example, cluster sampling is done by listing all cities, then calculating the population and divide by 30, and this would give you your sampling interval. You then select a random number less than or equal to the sampling interval and this will form your first cluster. Random number plus sampling interval is equal to your second cluster. Okay, so this is the visual representation of what I have mentioned to you. So there's section 1 and then you get a cluster from section 5. So what's the difference between strata and clusters? All strata are represented in the sample, but only a subset of clusters are in the sample. With stratified sampling, test results occur when elements within strata are homogeneous. However, with cluster sampling, the best results occur when elements within clusters are internally heterogeneous. There is multi-stage sampling, which is a complex form of comp cluster sampling in which two or more levels of units are embedded one on the other. Multi-phase sampling, it's part of the information collected from whole samples, then a part of a subsample. Quota sampling, the population is first segmented into mutually exclusive subgroups. Then judgment is used to select subjects or units from each segment based on a specified proportion. Convenient sampling. It's grab or opportunity sampling, accidental or haphazard sampling. The sample being drawn from that part of the population which is close to hand. Snowball sampling. It's similar to convenient sampling where existing study subjects are used to recruit more subjects into the sample. Purposive sampling. The researcher chooses the sample based on who they think would be appropriate for the study. This is used primarily when there is a limited number of people that have expertise in the area being researched. Panel sampling. Method of first selecting a group of participants through a random sampling method and then asking that group for the same information again several times over a period of time. We could have errors in sample and we must minimize these errors. Systematic errors would mean bias, inaccurate responses, and selection bias. Sampling error would be a random error. So remember your type 1 error, the probability of finding a difference with our sample compared to population and there really isn't one, known as the alpha or type 1 error and usually set at 5%. Type 2 error is the probability of not finding a difference that actually exists. 
between our sample compared to the population. It's known as your beta or type 2 error. Power is 1 minus beta and is usually pegged at 18. This would be an example of sample size equations. And the following slides would be sample problems that you could practice on at your free time. To conclude.